Don't worry, don't worry. <coughs> hello, hello. Hello. Song, song, song. Hello? Senhoras e senhores, bom dia. Meu nome é Mariano Laplane. Eu sou professor do Instituto de Economia da Unicamp e diretor de Relações Internacionais da Unicamp. Tenho a honra de apresentar a nossa conferencista da sessão magna, que agora iniciamos, a professora Mariana Mazzucato. A professora Mariana nasceu na Itália, mas migrou, ainda criança, com família para os Estados Unidos. Anos mais tarde, depois de ter completado seu doutorado em economia na New School for Social Research, em Nova York, e de ter lecionado em várias universidades americanas, voltou para a Europa como professora, pesquisadora da Universidade de Sussex, na Science Policy, Policy Research Unit em Brighton, até o ano passado, quando ela se transferiu para eh, University College, em Londres, onde ela eh, dirige o Institute for Innovation and Social Purpose. A professora é editora e parecerista de diversos jornais, periódicos científicos, tem dezenas de trabalhos publicados em periódicos, projetos de pesquisa financiados por instituições públicas e privadas de fomento. Em 2013, após a publicação do seu livro O Estado Empreendedor, o prestígio dela ultrapassou os limites da academia e, de fato, a professora se tornou uma figura internacionalmente reconhecida. A obra da professora... Mariana, mostra a importância das iniciativas públicas para financiar, fazer avançar a ciência e a tecnologia. Iniciativas públicas em infraestrutura, investimentos públicos em infraestrutura, formação de recursos humanos, financiamento de projetos de alto risco, são essenciais para gerar crescimento e desenvolvimento. Iniciativas desse tipo, iniciativas públicas desse tipo, geram valor, valor público, valor para a sociedade. E são, como a professora costuma demonstrar com eloquência nas suas apresentações e nas suas obras, absolutamente insubstituíveis. Eu não preciso enfatizar aqui a importância dessas reflexões no momento atual, no Brasil, hoje. Então, sem mais... Eu passo a palavra para a professora Mariana para a sua apresentação de 40 minutos. Teremos depois 20 minutos para perguntas, comentários, debates. Obrigado a todos. Palavra com a professora. Thank you, Mariano. Where did you go? Okay. We have the same name, so it's very, it's very convenient. <laughs> Um, so what I would like to do is also make you a bit uncomfortable, no? Because I think we're all quite comfortable in this room. We all think we are, you know, out there to have more science, more innovation. We know that's important for growth, and we might be a bit uh, unhappy 
with the level of spending in different areas. I think we heard it uh, in the question time of the last session. But to get out of a complaining mood, as, and, and I'm the biggest complainer, so, you know, mea culpa, to a more constructive one, yeah? Also, if you want full of hope, we really need to get our hands dirty on what works, what doesn't, and the lessons that can actually be learned from that. And so I want to focus on this idea about mission orientation. And um, I should also say that I, it's, it's my fault <laughs> in some ways that the European Commission has gone down this route because for about six years I've been uh, trying to get them to make it much more specific on what do we mean by challenge-led innovation, right? We have this Horizon 2020 program, which for years now has been talking about using innovation to drive new types of growth in the European uh, Union, and we very much have you know, used words like... Um, like uh, smart, inclusive, and sustainable growth to drive that discussion, and then not much changes, yeah? And then also some of the programs can easily be changed depending on who's in power. And so the idea of, you know, what, let's actually learn from what did it mean for basic research, for applied research, for the whole innovation system, when governments were as ambitious as being able to dream like going to the moon, and back again within one generation, and how might we actually use that kind of thinking, which is both high risk, it's dreamy, but it's very specific, it's targeted. You can answer yes or no, did you get there or not, for the social challenges that we have ahead, right? That was almost a purely technological feat. And I'll get to this towards the end of the presentation, but I just want to say now that there is a real opportunity, if you want, given to me by being the special advisor of Carlos Modas, who is the Commissioner for Innovation in the European Commission, whose budget was just approved last week, 100 billion euros, to really use this mission thinking, not just for the one third of that budget, which might be around missions, compared to the other third, perhaps for the ERC, the other third for the EIC, but to actually use this thinking to even drive how we think about what is basic research for? What are the conversations we need between basic research and applied research? And how do we really get an organizationally strong uh, uh, setup within our innovation systems at the level of the nation states, but also at the level of the regions, right? So the European Union is a, is a region, but it's full of all these member states. Of course, in Latin America, similarly, there's a region, and then it falls down to, you know, who does or not have a public bank, for example? And is that public bank mission-oriented, or is it just giving out handouts to industry to do nothing again, right? So these lessons about the organizational structure of innovation systems, what can we learn from a period in history when there was a bit more ambition? So this first slide is really just saying, hey, how cool. There's actually real excitement out there. If you go to the European Commission, they are using these words. If you go to the UN, they are using this kind of challenge-led uh, thinking, the OECD as well, and definitely at the member state level, not just in the European Union, in Brazil. I mean, we were just hearing no, about these different priorities, and obviously in Korea, but that's almost the most kind of emblematic part of the world that has been thinking like this. But in Brazil, you are talking about I always have a hard time saying it. Is it desafios or desafios? Desafios. <laughs> right? So you're talking about the challenges. But what does this then mean for how you set up your instruments, your policies, and your system of innovation? Um, but this is all good, right? I mean, there's more than 100 countries that have actually set, signed up to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. They themselves are very clear about what the challenges are. Um, we have a, a comeback after years of blasphemy of industrial strategy in many countries, even in the UK, after uh, uh, many years of austerity, this idea that, mm, you know, in order to rebalance the economy, perhaps we do have to uh, think again about what do we even mean by industrial strategy. And we've set up a commission, I should let you know, in the UK, which is called a Commission for Mission-Oriented Industrial Strategy, precisely in order to think what would it look like to have an industrial strategy which is focused on problems, right, challenges, so that when you have, for example, a public bank, you're not giving out money to a sector as some sort of sectoral priority, but the organizations across many different sectors that are willing, so pick the willing, 
not pick the winners, willing to engage with some of these difficult you know, problems and challenges in what I will soon define as a mission. So this is all fantastic, right? There's energy out there. But what I want to argue in order to, sorry, uh, yeah, to lead up to the sort of mission concept and to really unpick it is that we continue, unfortunately, to have a very limited toolkit, literally the toolkit that policymakers, whether they are in a city doing city planning or an industrial strategy or around international issues, the toolkit they have that they use in order to address problems continues to be quite boring. And we ourselves in our community, I think in the innovation community, sometimes replicate some of the, this boringness, and which, which is very much about, you know, we need more infrastructure and science and you know, these kind of basic conditions. Um, we have to, as policymakers, we often hear this idea of you know, leveling the playing field, uh, using whether it's the tax system or the regulation system in, in order to get the right conditions. Or in the European Commission, the terming was the framework program. We need the right framework uh, in order for innovation to thrive. And it's not that these frameworks or these horizontal conditions are not important. What I will argue is that it's absolutely not enough. And if we don't have the equivalent vocabulary for these more directional pushes, which will actually allow us to confront these challenges, we're going to be in trouble. But more specifically, the, within economics, and I'm an economist, I'm not sure how many other economists you have uh, during the day, but in economics, it's very much continues to be wed to at best fixing some sort of problem, right? You fix a market failure, you fix some sort of system failure. And in the financing area, you at best are financing you know, SMEs or somehow you know, getting everyone to have that equal possibility to rise up um, and you know, fund what? What is it that you want the SMEs or the middle size or the large companies to actually be doing? And do we have an equivalent vocabulary for that? And it's quite interesting also, I find that at least at the central banking level, we've accepted some of this kind of boring, passive language like lender of last resort, right? I mean, it, all these words are you know, useful, but actually quite passive, right? De-risking, enabling, incentivizing, facilitating, lender of last resort, fixing a problem. It's like, my God, you almost want to fall asleep after you've read all these words, no? So what I want to do is kind of wake you up and say, we need not just a new vocabulary, we need a new narrative, we need a new story to make the kind of arguments that I've been hearing today in the Q&A period. And if we don't do that, we're stuck and very little will change. Um, and so, you know, in terms of fixing failures, the idea that we need to spend more on basic research that someone said depressed them when they saw how much the Koreans were spending, that can be framed in different ways. You can make that argument, you can sound like you're being really radical, oh God, we're not spending enough on this stuff, but as long as it's just framed as fixing a positive externality problem, which is the classic public good, and hence basic research, you're gonna have a problem making your argument, yeah? Or as long as if someone's interested in energy and all the different problems around pollution and how to actually get industry to change, as long as it's just seen something like a carbon tax, fixing the problem of negative externalities, which are a classic market failure, you're going to have a problem. And so what I tried to push now for some years, and apologies if some of this is going to be repetitive, at the level of the where are civil servants trained, the ones who actually are going to conduct the policies that you want, yeah? They don't have a curriculum that is equally ambitious as the one that, you know, the top managers get at the top business schools, 
where they get to take these cool courses in strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. I mean, how cool is that, right? They get to actually, you know, they're told, you are value creators. You must invest inside your company in capabilities and competencies. You might lose your absorptive capacity, is what we told Dell computers when they just started to assemble stuff they were no longer making. Yeah? You will lose your capacity to even understand the future, the whole point of today's wonderful conference. Um, you must learn from trial and error. And don't worry if you screw up. Just brag about it later and just say that you're going to, you know, I mean, Zuckerberg's incredible. The last month, he says, yes, yeah, sorry, you made a huge mistake. We'll learn. Don't worry. He's like, really? Can you imagine if a government had done what Facebook's done? It would have been like, forget it. You're fired. You're out. Um, you know, make those strategic choices. And as Steve Jobs said, you must be hungry and foolish. You will never innovate if you're not hungry and foolish. So if we do want these new partnerships between public and private and third sector to confront those great challenges I had on my first slide, you know, we all have to be a bit hungry and foolish, don't we? Instead, civil servants are told to do the opposite. And then we complain that they're boring and bureaucratic and inertial. We've taught them to be that. And the few that aren't, and I shouldn't say few, there's plenty of great civil servants around the world, and I meet them all the time, and I'm impressed by how able they are to recover from the depression <laughs> that you know, sets in when at best you're seen as a facilitator. I, I worry about the translator. I, mean, I think you should just take these off, and if anything, just look at my hands. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you know, you're at best told to facilitate, de-risk, level, redistribute the value that's created somehow, somewhere else, fix stuff, right? And then, ironically, you're told you're boring. Um, and so what I did in my past work, which I'm just going to quickly kind of go over because I don't want to focus too much on that, but I've never actually spoken to this crowd, so a bit of repetition maybe will be good, is that if we are interested in innovation, especially innovation across different actors and innovation that can address social problems around health and energy, et cetera, we better at least know what we're talking about when we think about policy and the policy organizations and the networks and the relationships between different organizations that were required to get us some of the biggest changes of the past. And don't think of this as just high tech. I mean, Carlota Perez always reminds me the massive social and organizational innovations that were equally uh, ambitious in terms of the role that policy had to play there. And all these big GPTs, the general purpose technologies, which massively affected uh, production, consumption, and distribution across many economies, but especially productivity across many different sectors, really required a different level of ambition and toolkit. But because it wasn't talked about, things happened, but we didn't actually create an alternative to the market failure, system failure view, it's been actually really hard to learn from those experiences. Um, I have a funny story that I once spoke to the head of uh, Yozma in Israel, which is a public venture capital uh, program. And he said, Mariana, obviously we're doing what you're saying. We're much more ambitious. We're not just fixing market failures. We're creating markets. We're shaping them. But let us just talk about fixing markets. That way no one disturbs us, right? You know, so, so, or in the, in the US, what we often say is they talk Jefferson, but they act Hamilton, right? And the problem is when you don't talk about it, you know, psychotherapists say, talk about it, talk to me. You know, I, I can think of De Niro in that funny film when he said, you know, let's talk. Um, if you don't talk about it, we don't learn, yeah? So what I want to argue is that the market failure process didn't get us the GPTs, and it definitely won't get us the SDGs. And this even rhymes, so it's great, right? So, I mean, if we want to transform the 17 Sustainable Development Goals into concrete missions that actually require lots of different investment across different actors, across different sectors, and in the sciences across different disciplines, what do we know about what got us some of this transformative change in the past? Because that's what innovation is. It's about transformational change. It's about structural change. Um, and we better know what we're talking about when we're thinking about it. So um, in the other book that I wrote, which I love because of the German translation, I don't think I'll ever write a book again that's called Das Kapital. And you know you've done something right when that's the translation. It's going to have a huge effect, even maybe revolution. 
So I do want to argue that it should have been understood as a revolution, but unfortunately it created lots of consensus. Oh yeah, wow, great, yes. Of course we should have an entrepreneurial state. But the real implications of thinking in this new way, of thinking in an active market co-creation, market co-shaping, not market fixing way, requires literally a revolution in how we think of the role of different types of public institutions that we have and the new ones that we should be building. Um, and I actually organized, I'm glad Caetano's here, I see you. Uh, so Caetano Penna, who's here, and I organized a conference in um, 2014 where we actually brought all these public organizations around the world, including Brazilian ones. We had BNDS, for example, there. In fact, they helped co-fund this, where we said, let's talk. Let's talk, right? <laughs> what did you do? How did you do it? And so this is a wonderful quote from Cheryl Martin, uh, who was the second director of ARPA-E, which is the sister organization of DARPA, which, as you know, was very important for the internet, but in the DOE. And we said, listen, tell us what you did. For example, how do you welcome risk-taking and uncertainty? Do you actually brag about your failures, like Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs do, like any venture capitalist does? Just speak to any VC guy, you're like, oh my god. They say, yeah, you know, we failed there, we failed there, but then we succeeded, right? It's like, wow, you brag about failing. How, you know, in an organization like ARPA-E, which has tried to really innovate within the energy space, how do you talk about that, your failures? And she said, we actually even judge our success by how much risk we were willing to take, and if we didn't take risks, if we don't fail, we're not doing our job because we know that what we're trying to do is not facilitating, but taking, the, you know, taking on the difficulties alongside the private sector, uh, but also how much real impact our successes had. And if you break this down into, well then how do you judge that impact? Is this just a gadget, or is this things like you know, battery storage, which ARPA-E has so far been the most a uh, big innovator in that area within a government department. Um, what does that mean to actually transform that even beyond the little battery storage area, but to really then have policies on the demand side, which allow these new technologies to be fully diffused and fully deployed across the economy, as much as, say, suburbanization did for the mass production revolution. This is, again, something Carlotta always reminds us about, that without suburbanization, all these mass-produced products back in the early or mid-1900s wouldn't actually have you know, been out there inside the economy. What is the equivalent today on the demand side of suburbanization to allow these green technologies to get fully diffused and deployed? Anyway, very interesting conversation. And also with Caetano, we ended up writing a report for uh, Dilma's government uh, directed by Aldo Rebelo about, well, what are the lessons also for the Brazilian economy uh, what can we understand about the actual organizations, you know, Embrapa, FINEP, and BNDS, Embraer, what, what went on in these organizations, what worked, what didn't, to what degree did you need, for example, also someone like Gadelio to be running the Department of Health in order for then the health innovation in the innovation state and the welfare state to really work together. And again, that is where I think some of the most interesting work should be going, and very few people think about this. You know, how can we use the form of a national healthcare system, like SUS, to actually provide the diffusion, the deployment of innovations, but also the learning. We worked with Sebastián Lureiro back in, God, 10 years ago, from the University of Bahia. He does public health, and he looked at how the form of SUS actually helped the learning of the doctors who were using CAT scan equipment at the time, so diagnostics in completely new communities that they weren't working with before when it was only private, uh, the healthcare system. How can you really learn from the learning by doing and trial and error and error and error of innovation in a different type of setup, social construct like the SUS system that you have here? Um, and especially thinking about that in the future. How can we redevise healthcare systems so they are better aligned with innovation systems and vice versa? And how can we even redefine what we mean by innovation in, for example, pharmaceuticals to include access? Who has access to this stuff? Shouldn't that be how we talk about uh, the innovation itself? Anyway, so what I just want to do is just kind of lay out some terminology um, in order to then really confront this issue of, of missions, which I'm really happy that Andres today already kind of introduced. 
And the first thing is that by just thinking about you know, the market failure process, you would at best kind of think that you would need lots of science funding there, uh, perhaps a bit of you know, SME financing in order to address the uh, asymmetric information problem. But what actually we need to be thinking about is the entire innovation chain. I've already mentioned some of the words, not basic research, applied research, those arrows that go back and forth. So the, the feedback effects, the serendipity, how, it, how does it work? Learning, for example, from the Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany, uh, which we've tried to copy in the UK with the catapult centers, but anyway, we can talk about that later, but we haven't succeeded very well. Um, but also that early stage finance for the few, let me repeat, the few companies that are willing to play with some of these missions, yeah? I will repeat, going away from pick the winners to pick the willing. Who's willing, public, private, third sector, who's willing to play with you know, ambitions around uh, health challenges and energy challenges? And how do you actually provide those organizations that strategic, patient, long-term finance that they required versus having these myths about SMEs, you know, la piccola impresa, we say in Italy, and I'm sure you call it something similar. And even more downstream, procurement policy, and even more downstream, those demand side policies I was talking about before. And these you know, different acronyms here are just some of the most famous organizations in the US that played a very important role in the public sector, simply to say that even though everyone talks about Silicon Valley, and they do, you know, they simply do, and they try to copy it in different ways, whether it's the science parks, Silicon Roundabout, uh, <laughs> quite funny actually, in East London, you know, actually did they learn what some of the real lessons were from how DARPA, how ARPA-E were set up, how Yasma thinks about risk, how the SBIR program, which is a procurement program to help SMEs to really scale up, because who cares about SMEs if they're not scaling up along uh, an, an innovation mission? How did that work? InQtel, by the way, is a public venture capital fund inside the CIA. Uh, which has been very important, very underanalyzed. How did they work? And the first thing is, you know, just look at their websites. They don't use any of this fixing terminology. Um, and they're very ambitious, and I purposely put up here um, Embrapa. Embrapa's mission is to provide research, development, and innovation solutions for the sustainability of agriculture and for the benefit of Brazilian society, responding to the demands of agriculture while anticipating and facing the global challenges of the future. How can you anticipate anything? How can you think about challenges of the future if at the same time you, and I'm not talking about Embrapa, but equivalent organizations around the world, have stopped investing in your own kind of knowledge creation process and increasingly, like NASA, the National Space Agency, outsourcing so many of the different functions. And I have no problem with outsourcing per se, but a really interesting thing that we've been trying to document actually in this new institute I've set up at UCL, which will also produce, a, will within a year have a new uh, master's in public administration about some of these lessons, is um, you know, just how much the idea about public-private partnerships, which sounds good, you know, partnership, that sounds like really like nice and friendly, has actually also translated and an increasing outsourcing of the brains of the public side to the private side, so that partnership actually becomes increasingly problematic. Just like if a husband and a wife, and one is all really exciting and is allowed to call itself the value creator and the one who goes out there and does interesting things, and the other one is facilitating it, or you know, the, the other partner, it will probably be an abusive marriage. And I would argue that that's what we've gotten into. But anyway, these are all interesting missions, right? They are absolutely saying they want to be uh, 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 co-creating and co-shaping. And in fact, all the organizations that were behind the smart stuff and all of your smart products, whether it's DARPA or you know, NASA, et cetera, so internet, GPS, touchscreen display, and Siri, weren't just about public money. These were public organizations able to think in that Cheryl Martin way, taking risks, being willing to take risks, thinking of what their mission was in a society, and really welcoming those spillovers. And actually, most of this stuff in your iPhone was a spillover from actually trying to address something bigger, right? They weren't thinking about the internet for the sake of the internet. 
it was on the way towards solving a very concrete communication problem between different public entities that were very um, ambitious in, in space, but not just space. Um, anyway, also in health, we know that, uh, at least in the US and many different uh, health organizations, definitely Fiocruz in Brazil, have been having these missions to transform those landscapes. But what is very interesting is the degree to which that ambition, which in this case, is not just a lot of money, you know, over 30 billion a year. This is direct. This is not about indirect spending. This is not about facilitating private pharmaceutical companies by, you know, reducing their tax or, or just, you know, thinking of the best regulation scheme. These were actual public funds spent in specific areas, which then, surprise, surprise, this is a wave. It looks like a wave, right? I didn't even try. It literally looks like a wave was surfed. You know, I think I was spent the day yesterday at the beach surfing. The, the, the venture capitalists surfed this wave. They came in 30 years later, right, to do biotech. And the whole question of how do you actually do two things, really create that wave through direct spend, A. B, organize your structure, in this case the National Institutes of Health, that really can welcome that, again, experimentation, exploration process, but three, um, crowd in business investment, right? Actually create the new landscapes, you know, that Embrapa talks about, the future challenges, that then gets business excited, that they then want to invest, right? Uh, because what actually drives business investment, Warren Buffett, by the way, never tires of saying this, what drives business investment is the perception of where the future opportunities are. And if you just think about being business friendly, you're ironically gonna be very bad for business, right? Because you're thinking in the way that business is thinking today. And if they're not doing something today, perhaps they should be a bit penalized for it. They shouldn't be rewarded just through a government handout. What policy is for is creating the next generation of opportunities that gets business excited to want to invest, that makes them want to roar yeah, those animal spirits, and then you can introduce these little tax credits here and there. But if you just focus on things like R&D tax credits without creating these waves, nothing happens. It just increases profits and not investment. And guess what? Profits globally are at record levels. There is no profits problem. There is an investment problem. And if you, know, if you increase profits, those profits can sorts of places, whether it's to golfing or other things. It doesn't necessarily get plowed back in. And a record level problem around the world today of hoarding, so inert capital, as well as financialization, so large businesses spending an increasing amount on things like share buybacks, you know, to boost share prices, stock options. So really unlocking private investment is key. I already mentioned SBIR, this is all about, you know, actually really providing that patient strategic finance to the companies that are willing, but increasingly this kind of finance around the world has happened through different types of public banks. And with a colleague, uh, Gregor and I have been looking at this using the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Database. It's quite striking that within renewable energy, uh, the real big public actors are, are very different actually from the ones that drove the ICT revolution. These are increasingly public banks. And BNDS, by the way, up until two years ago, um, Lavinia will tell me what's happening more recently, but definitely the years that we were working with BNDS, they were also extremely ambitious in this space. But the four big banks working around, um, both on the supply side, but also the full diffusion and deployment of, of renewable energy were the China Development Bank, the German Development Bank called KFW, the European Investment Bank, and BNDS. Uh, up in that right-hand, upper right-hand quadrant, willing to take on the capital intensity, willing to take on the risk. But then always what mattered was which instruments were used, right? This was not about handouts. The co-investment, the willingness to invest in new areas that then could get business excited, how that was done, and the ability to not just crowd in, but I would argue to dynamize in, to do something even more exciting than crowding in, it's very hard to learn from that when it's not talked about. In the KFW, you see here very classic counter-cyclical financing, which is what you would expect from a public bank. What they did, though, was also direct that financing towards uh, climate protection projects. But this immediately, if you don't have a framework for thinking about it, gets accused of 
you know, crowding out business because you should really just be kind of spraying, you know, investment and loans to all these cute little SMEs, don't actually tell the country what to do. But what was interesting with KFW, and this is important for the missions discussion, is they really played alongside the game of the Energie Wende mission in Germany, which came about, uh, I mean, Merkel in some ways did set it top down, but it actually came from decades of the green movement really fighting for nuclear to be uh, reduced. But what they did in Germany, they said every sector, every sector has to transform itself. So the KFW used its lending program for that transformation so that steel, instead of asking for handouts as they do in the US, and Trump is about to give massive handouts to steel and coal, steel had to transform itself, lowering its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle in order to access these loans. So this is not about SMEs, this is about small, medium, and large companies willing to change along the climate protection project Energiewende mission. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, but uh, BNDS also over the years has invested more and more in these ambitious areas and is no longer just seeing itself in terms of you know, infrastructure and capital development, but increasingly through different types of innovation programs directed at transformational growth in Brazil has changed its instruments. China is extraordinary. The level of funding here is huge <laughs> for companies that are willing, willing to go along with their energy transformation. Many of the companies will, in fact, fail. That's normal. As we know, uh, you know, Solyndra also failed in the US. This whole thing about capital of the state is really important to come back to this, right? That these are portfolios of investments which require that risk taking. So for every Tesla, Tesla received a huge amount of money from the US government. Elon Musk, by the way, five billion, five billion dollars, that's nine zeros. Most of you are scientists, so I know you know that. Five billion dollars is what one man, Elon Musk, got for his three companies in the US, uh, Tesla, Solar City, and SpaceX. Um, you know, that is the kind of funding we're seeing here. But this whole thing about welcoming failure is important. But it's not enough. What's striking in the US is that Solyndra got 500 million, Tesla got 465 million. One succeeded, which one? Tesla. You all know that story, but you didn't maybe know that it got that money, early stage money from the US government. Most of you probably know about the Solyndra story because it failed. So the way in which that was, on the one hand, sort of set up like a portfolio, but they didn't talk about it. <laughs> so they didn't really set it up as a portfolio, as a VC would, which is get some of the upside from the Tesla success to cover the downside Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. How to do that portfolio thinking with public funds, maybe in some public banks, because they're banks, they have a you know, rate of return on investments, has been thought about but not really across the broader uh, set of public institutions. And you wouldn't really worry about that upstream on the basic research. You should just assume that the public return is through the knowledge spillovers. But when it's specific companies that are getting these kinds of funds, you know, why not? And we really actually should have more of an engagement between, for example, public banks and organizations like the BBC in the UK, which has been extremely innovative. And this, again, is something we're doing in the Institute. We've set up a network of public organizations to learn from each other and how different types of returns might be earned back to the public, including conditions of reinvestment. If you are an industry that has generated huge profits as a result of these massive public investments, what conditions should be attached so those profits are reinvested back into production and innovation and not hoarded, not going offshore, or not just golfing, yeah, as, a, as an example. Um, let me just move on quickly. This is really just to say that what's interesting in looking at how the public organizes itself in terms of its funding, this direct versus indirect, right? Direct by actually funding something cool and new, which crowds in business investment versus tax deductions, which are these indirect tax incentives, varies greatly between the world. But what we do know is that those who spend not just more directly, not just much more as well, but also really have the right kind of organizations that are able to think in a more mission-oriented way and, and kind of attract that expertise within the organizations, surprise, surprise, 
end up with rates of business spending on R&D that are higher than those who, who don't do that, yeah? So this is all about public and private. So how do we think again? How do we get rid of this boring dichotomy, yeah? So what I want to focus on now is this notion of missions and kind of bringing it away from just a European kind of bureaucratic talk um, and, and kind of go through with you what I tried to do in this pamphlet as I wrote in February uh, for the commission and then it was set out for um, consultation across Europe to felt like hundreds of thousands of organizations, me, so I, I turned off my email for a while, uh, <laughs> saying, I have a mission, I have a mission, which is a problem, eh? I should say, the point of missions is let's get away from sectors which, as we know, have captured industrial policy and innovation policy for many years. If then we just allow missions to become another way for organizations of different types, including academics, to capture policy, we're back at square one, right? So missions should not just be a trendy thing. Oh, I have a mission, I'm an academic, I have a mission, my institute is great, fund me. No, <laughs> yes, fund me, but not for that. Um, anyway, so the idea is this, you begin with the challenges, and we know a lot about them. You don't start from scratch, right? We, we've got the SDGs, let's start there. Or within different countries, there's very specific challenges. Just think of Brazil's challenges around, again, health, around the way that you're interacting with the energy landscape and trying to link it also with your, one of your biggest resources, which is water, just the different ways that you've thought about challenges within this country. But if you leave it at the challenges, nothing happens, yeah? Transform those into missions as ambitious as going to the moon and back again, but focus on ones that really require kind of intersectoral uh, different types of public, private, third sector, but within the sectors, industrial sectors, different types of investments, but then really use your policy instruments to get that bottom up that bottom-up exploration and experimentation and welcoming of risk and uncertainty, as Cheryl Martin said, has to be done. Just as an example, so this isn't just blah, 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 you know, a challenge like cleaning our oceans, making it concrete in terms of reduction of 90% of the plastics entering the marine environment and collection of more than half of the plastics present in the oceans by a certain date. So you can answer yes or no, did you get there? Whereas what do you say when it's just kind of climate change or clean oceans? Did you get there? Well, I don't know, it's just so vague, yeah? Transform it into the concrete mission. Think about ways in which you can get lots of different sectors to invest, unlock that investment, and your instruments to really drive that bottom-up experimentation process. Um, and, and, and this is where you do the pick the willing, yeah? Pick the willing, you don't do SMEs or steel or automotive or aerospace, you do hey, out there, any of you, <laughs> organizations in any sector, willing, let's play. Um, climate change, again, 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030, this was just an example. Um, citizen health and well-being, these are, again, looking at the SDGs, decreasing the burden of dementia and you know, increasing the independence of people with Alzheimer's in their own homes, all the different types of investments across sectors and bottom-up experimentation. Um, and so one of the things that the report does is, well, how do you select a mission? And who decides? Yeah, is it a Kennedy moment where one guy and his friends, kind of friends in government, decide to the moon, back again in a generation? Or, perhaps more interestingly, especially in an era of populism where people have really divorced themselves from the political process and also had much less faith in what all this policy and politics means for your life, how do you really engage with civil society uh, for example, nurse, you know, the nurses' movement, or the nurses that know a lot about care, how do you get them involved in setting these missions in a similar way that some of the green movement in Germany was absolutely involved in helping to frame the Energiewende uh, mission. So, the, so they should be bold and address societal value, things that matter, you know, Cheryl Martin's thing, they must matter. Uh, concrete targets, you better set, you know, you, you, you better be able to say when you got there or not or you're just back at talking about challenges. Definitely, if this is about steering your uh, innovation system, involving research and innovation and technological readiness over a limited time period, but I should say here, in case I wasn't clear, this is not about replacing something like the ERC or the EIC, which is the same thing but in business. Yeah, these kind of bottom-up tools. This is a new way for also the ERC to be 
thinking about the way that the basic research and the applied research talk to each other, but currently in the European Commission, it's actually a separate pot, yeah? There's the ERC pot, there's a European Innovation Council pot for, the, for businesses, and then there's a separate pot. We don't know exactly how they're gonna divide it up. Someone asked before in the Q&A, but this, these missions are you know, about the existing challenge-led programs, how to actually get them to make a difference. Um, so really involving the research and innovation also that's, being, uh, that's coming out of the ERC to help drive this is key. I would say the fourth bullet point is the most important, which is this is about different sectors, different actors, public, private, third sector, and different disciplines, including the humanities, to work together towards solving these problems. And we shouldn't forget the humanities. Believe me, you know, poets, uh, historians, anthropologists are essential to help frame these problems in ambitious ways. Um, and multiple competing solutions. This is also incredibly important because if it's purely top down, we know it's not gonna work. The Soviet system did not work. They were spending plenty on research and innovation, but it was too top down. So how to really get that bottom up this is what the report kind of goes into in terms of implementation. I won't bore you with it, but definitely just look at some of these, you know, proactive portfolio management. You know, this time, don't get taken for a ride. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary if you look at what's happening today in space, where Novartis is working for free on the International Space Station. That's not a portfolio approach. <laughs> That's a free riding approach. So how do you really set up this kind of ambition within organizations and the instruments to think about both the risk and the return, but especially be adaptive organizations, flexible organizations that can work together with different types of actors across those sectors? It's key. How to actually do accountability along the way. Anyway, we can talk perhaps about it a bit in the discussion. As I said, in the Institute, we've taken this seriously and put it at the core. One of the core things is, what do we even mean by public value, social value, public return, when we haven't allowed the public to be seen as an equal value creator, co-creator, co-shaping, co-creation of missions? The words have to change. We've made plenty of postcards. I'm happy to give some out I brought today, which is just change how you talk about things. No more de-risking. Talk about welcome uncertainty. You're not fixing markets, co-creating and shaping. You're not leveling, you're tilting. You're not picking winners, you're picking the willing. You definitely can't do net present value and cost benefit analysis <laughs> for the missions. Don't even bother starting if that's how you're gonna do the counting. Um, so that's really all I have to say, except that if the focus is value, which is what I think is absolutely key, and sorry if this is super self-promotional, but I just finished the book, it just came out, so you have to buy it, and Compania de Letras is coming out with it, um, for me, this is where it has to begin. If the organizations in government don't understand what public value is, if they can't nurture it, if they can't measure it, if they don't talk about themselves as co-creating value, it ain't gonna happen. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana, for a very inspiring conference. Temos tempo para perguntas, comentários eh, em blocos de três. Então, a palavra está aberta. Hi. Uh, português ou inglês? Well, hi, I'm Marcelo França from the Institute of Physics in UFRJ, and uh, my question is, um, so how in a semi-democratic, yet not necessarily fully structured society, um, how do you factor in politicians in the plan, and, and who are the main, main actors that need to get together to to put forward such a, a plan. Mais uma, mais um comentário, pergunta. Bom dia. Bom dia. Eu sou Marília Santana, eu trabalho no Sebrae, no projeto de bioeconomia. Meu nome é Marília Santana, eu trabalho no Sebrae, no projeto de bioeconomia, e um dos objetivos é o fomento à criação de bio startups. Eu também sou doutoranda de Ciências Ambientais da UERJ e eu gostaria de saber 
dentro das suas metodologias né, de, de desafios, de contribuições, se o Hackathon, se as competições, os ecocamps de inovação são instrumentos eficazes para conseguir superar essas, esses problemas do mercado e apresentar soluções, porque aqui nós promovemos bastante, tentando aproximar essas inovações das micro e pequenas empresas. Eu gostaria de saber a sua experiência, a sua visão com esse respeito. Mais uma, por favor. Tirando o microfone. Boa tarde. Eu vou falar em português. Eu já conheço bastante os trabalhos da Mariana, mas sempre é muito, é muito gratificante ver e, é, e, e muito provocativo para o contexto que a gente está hoje no, no país. Né? E algo que me chamou muito a atenção é que se a gente move uma política industrial, uma política de inovação para os objetivos sociais, elas deixam de ser um tema apenas dos economistas e dos cientistas e se torna um tema da sociedade. Nós estamos aqui na Academia Brasileira de Ciências. A própria dicotomia entre as ciências sociais e as ciências humanas e as ciências naturais perdem sentido, porque o, o nós, economistas, somos muito ignorantes para entender o sistema de bem-estar em saúde, por exemplo, os, as mudanças climáticas, as questões que envolvem as, as, os grandes dilemas da sociedade. né? Na Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, a gente tem procurado articular demandas do Sistema Único de Saúde com biotecnologia. É, eu queria, então, só quase que uma provocação para a própria é, academia, né? o quanto que os temas das ciências sociais se tornam é, cruciais numa perspectiva voltada para os desafios. E parabéns, e foi uma honra estar aqui é, assistindo essa palestra. Mais uma pergunta aqui na, aqui na frente. Em primeiro lugar, muito obrigado pela sua palestra, brilhante palestra. É, eu queria só lembrar que tivemos algumas experiências aqui no Brasil muito interessantes, mas que de alguma forma se perderam. É, e uma mais recente, é, da qual eu participei muito ativamente, o Mariano também estava participando lá, é a quarta Conferência Nacional de Ciência, Tecnologia e Inovação para o Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Ocorreu em 2010, reuniu milhares de pessoas, foi precedida por conferências regionais em todo o país. Ela envolveu uh, governo, academia, indústria, Confederação Nacional das Indústrias, Fiesp participou, movimentos sociais, índios da Amazônia participaram, né? sindicatos, operários... E, e, e foi possível chegar, depois de reuniões por todo o país, regionais e temáticas, a um livro final, que é o Livro Azul da Quarta Conferência Nacional, com recomendações surpreendentemente consensuais entre esses vários setores. Mas parou aí. Né? É, continuamos querendo aquelas, aquelas propostas. Né? Então, propostas já existem. Né? Elas por exemplo, uma grande proposta é sobre biodiversidade, uma biotecnologia baseada na biodiversidade, energias limpas, né? claro, é, qualidade da educação básica, fundamental para o país, né? é, novas tecnologias, nanotecnologia, está lá, a proposta é sobre inovação, né? apoio à inovação, necessidade de interação entre academia e indústria, está tudo lá. Então, já houve essa grande movimentação. Agora, faltou é, adesão, né? do governo depois disso, até agora. Né? Falta essa adesão, nós não tivemos essa adesão. Então, eu acho que é uma experiência interessante, muito singular do Brasil, né? essa grande conferência nacional sobre esse tema, que pegou um semestre inteiro, porque houve as reuniões preparatórias, mas o que eu posso dizer é que, em relação às propostas realizadas, então, continuamos querendo continuamos querendo. Elas continuam atuais, infelizmente, né, por não terem sido realizadas. Então, queria uma apreciação sua sobre esse tipo de movimento e, de certa forma, o insucesso que teve, porque né, nós não conseguimos tudo aquilo, apesar da grande participação da sociedade nesse projeto. Obrigado. Mais alguma? 
Pergunta? Acho que vamos dar a chance à professora de, de responder, de comentar essas primeiras quatro questões. Sorry. Um, so thank you. Very good questions. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do this every time when I start talking. I forget to thank the host. So thank you so much. And also that it's in this museum, if you think of it, you know, the Museum of Tomorrow. This is everything we're talking about. So couldn't have been more appropriate. And I brought my 14-year-old daughter, who's very happy that she can actually have fun during one of my conferences and not sit there. Um, so anyway, so let me take them almost backwards. But I'll start with um, Carlos Cadello's uh, question, because I think it's very important, and it was exactly what I was trying to say in the first sentence that I did remember to say, which was, you shouldn't feel comfortable about this stuff. It should be upsetting the status quo, including in the academy. It's very easy for the academy, and, and, I, and by that I mean the bigger academy, not just the Academy of Sciences, to always kind of complain and to think, oh, the government, they don't understand this, when actually, you know, as much as the sectors have often captured the policy, the academy as well has, and they just end up wanting a piece of the pie, versus really to collaborate in a new way, create a new discussion, a new tension. No? I really think the word tension is good. We want a healthy tension. You know, it's not easy. When you set these missions, there's going to be conflict. You know, it wasn't easy for Germany to come up with the energy vende. That required fights. Um, people often remind me that, you know, two big advancements, which were birth control, and the AIDS, um, you know, the whole uh, attention to AIDS as a problem that required investment by the pharmaceutical companies happened through a movement. There's actually a movie out, have you seen it? The one on AIDS, ACT UP, on the ACT UP movement in France, but the bigger movement in the US was ACT UP. That was a movement that fought for one of these priorities and challenges and a very concrete mission to come about. The degree to which both the academy and government can harness movements yeah, as ambitious as the AIDS one was, as ambitious as the feminist one was around birth control, but thinking about what that is today around different issues, around health and the environment. Harness the movement, don't, don't squash the movement. Um, don't just call in the military, listen to what people are saying. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, uh, how to really make that as part of the mission setting as well. That's where the difficulty is and that's where the excitement will be because otherwise it just becomes the priority of a particular minister or president, it's their pet project, no? and then we wait for the next one to come about. So that ability to bring in the humanities and the social sciences, at least at the disciplinary level, but also to really get a new conversation between the sectors to help think about these missions, but then at the instrument level, use the instruments to bring in that kind of bottom-up experimentation. I think you know that's what the point is, but what I liked about what you said, um, Carlos, is that you know, how you bring in society and how we get the academy to step outside its current box, yeah, to really get a new also conversation between the disciplines, welcoming the humanities and the social sciences as much as the STEM subjects to think about societal relevance, which is the first bullet point on how do you select a mission. That's gonna be hard and that'll require some, you know, uh, people getting upset. And if you're willing to get upset and to engage in that, then I, then, then I would trust that process more. Um, and that actually goes to the first question on democracy. Um, you know, how do you actually engage the different stakeholders? You know, first of all, I'm an economist, so this isn't my expertise. We should get you know, people who actually really get this stuff properly. And you know, Mike Savage is a sociologist. I think the sociologists probably get this more than we do. But it definitely requires first listening. <laughs> and, you know, and also in, in academia, we like to talk and hear ourselves talk a lot, but the art of listening, mm, I don't know if we know how to do that very well. My husband, um, who's now a very you know, successful uh, movie producer, he even has a film in Cannes, in competition this year, uh, he started off with documentaries, and he would get all his documentary makers, he was a producer, is a producer, to first talk to this anthropologist, I can't remember her name, who wrote a book called The Art of Listening. And I do think that this, you know, it's an art. It's not, you have to learn it, actually. You have to, I mean, some people maybe are born with it. My mother sort of was, but um, I'm not. I'm sure, you know, most of us, PowerPoint, ah, listen to me, I'm so bright. How do you listen to civil society? And how then do you really get an engagement across these different stakeholders beyond then just the instruments issue? We should use this as an opportunity to rethink that. 
Um, the last question on um, by Luis, and then I'll come to the biotech one in a second. I mean, you know, when I was working for, or not for, you know, when Caetano and I were writing that uh, nice green report for, uh, in, the excuse was for Aldo Rebello, but it was actually, you know, through CG, and it was for, also for Dilma. I mean, I was in a great room with her and all her ministers once. She brought me in. There was 11 of them, including the finance minister who ended up going to the World Bank. It was a very interesting conversation. And um, one of the things we focused on was this issue of institutional and organizational capacity. So, for example, do public labs matter? What do we know about them? In, in the UK, by the way, we've disinvested completely in public labs. We do good higher education R&D, um, and but but you know the equivalent of CERN for different areas. We've disinvested in that. And what Aldo said to me, and it really stayed in my mind, he said, think of the Amazon. Think of the level of biodiversity that is there and all this talk about biodiversity. What would it look like to have the equivalent of CERN as an international public library, you know, uh, thinking about diet biodiversity, bringing the top scientists in the world set in the Amazon? That is very different from just having innovation, you know, policies around biodiversity. This is about building a laboratory attracting the top people to come there, and, and this really matters, right? Attraction of expertise. I always say that one of the points about thinking in a mission way is it becomes an honor to work there, right? So Steve Chu, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, was running the Department of Energy for Obama, and he's the one who set up ARPA-E. He would have never done that had Obama not actually said, we're gonna use $800 billion of our stimulus program, or at least a big chunk of it to re-steer the U.S. economy in a green direction. Later, as we know, things happened, you know, including uh, the Tea Party and the sequestration stuff, whatever. But he actually, that was the level of ambition. There's a whole book on that. And it was an honor for Steve Chu to direct that. So think of what does it mean to transform the kind of organizational and institutional capacity around these disafios, or disafios, I see, I forgot the name. Desafios. Ah, oh, that's what I said. Someone corrected me before and said this. <laughs> anyway, to have these challenges, missions, but to translate it into organizational capacity, A. B, make those places the coolest place to work where basic research and applied research talk to each other in new ways. It's not about we need more basic or we need more applied and we need you know, business funding for the applied. It's about really building an organizational structure and the policymakers to change how they talk about what they're doing in, you know, in something as ambitious as that. In Italy also, by the way, most of the instruments we have are simply kind of facilitating. We've disinvested from all of this. Uh, Italy has one of the highest rates in the world of renewable energy in terms of just kind of solar uh, things on people's roofs, but no investment in the actual production of you know, renewable energy and no actual organizational capacity in thinking about the future of sort of the green economy in Italy. No? So their ability to actually do it, and Brafa says in that, their mission statement, to really kind of help guide the conversation globally of what the future challenges are around sustainability requires actually an organization like Embrafa to be doing it with other organizations, collaborating with different organizations. But if you don't have that organizational capacity, it doesn't happen. And Brazil must learn about what worked and what didn't. You know, FINEPI, Fiocruz, um, you know, Embraer, very important Embraer because they were able to compete globally with you know, Boeing and Airbus, which also received huge amounts of public investment. But it wasn't just public investment. These were, again, particular types of organizations which were able to uh, uh, work with them, which is, I think, then the answer to that third question around biotech, um, your question, no? which is, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, this isn't my, uh, I, I don't know what's been happening in Brazil recently. Maybe Carlos can tell you more, but within biotech, which was the area you were talking about, I mean, one of the things is to step outside of biotech as a sector, yeah? Instead of seeing it as a sector that needs support, think of it as part of the solution towards addressing the problems, whether those problems are around biodiversity or the water issues or health issues. But really getting biotech to think outside of its box is something that we're trying to do with space, by the way. Space, the space, you know, rockets and stuff, thinking of space as one of the areas that interact with even immigration, right? If you said zero deaths on the Mediterranean, zero 
There's no one should die move, you know, going from Libya to uh, Sicily, <laughs> given the technology we have. And we have space technology that can, should be able to immediately see when there's a problem and we could activate uh, different types of investments from the local port authority to the space to all sorts of immigration services that then are there when the immigrants arrive. And, you know, I mean, you could see biotech and space as part of the solutions of, though, a problem. And I think this whole thing, also the Korean colleague was saying, problem, problem solving as the new lens. As long as, the, as long as we compare, though, we're not talking about the problem at the project level. We know how to do that. We all know how to do project financing and projects. We as academics are very good at getting grants. That's the project. We know about the challenges. We're all talking about the SDGs. We all, you know, blah, blah, blah. What we don't know is this thing about the missions, which have to be concrete but wide, really require car sectoral investment, and help get biotech to think outside of biotech, help get space to think outside of space, and then your institutions like BNDS would then you know, disperse the lending towards those few organizations willing to solve those problems. Obrigado. Eu acho que devemos encerrar por uma questão de tempo. Eu quero agradecer a presença de todos e, particularmente, da professora Mariana.